Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to UK 100's Lunchtime Learning webinar series. This is our series where we aim to bring together a range of different perspectives, insights and examples from across the network, but also the current and future best practice of net zero. My name is Christopher Hammond. I'm Chief Exec at UK 100, and I'll be chairing the session today. I'm joined by my excellent colleagues from UK 100, Tanisha Kapoor, who is the Research and Insights Manager, and Philip Glanville, who is our Director of Advocacy and Engagement. And we're really excited to be here today to share our new research, which looks at how we can put local climate action at the centre of any future devolution. So before we get into the detail, just the usual Zoom housekeeping rules. This is a Zoom webinar, meaning that only our panelists are visible. Uh, attendees can pose questions in the Q&A function, and we encourage you to ask any questions as we go through the report. There'll be links that we put in the chat so that you can follow along the things that we're discussing. The more votes a question has in the Q&A function, the more likely is we are to answer it. We'll try and get round to as many of your questions as possible as the time allows. The webinar is being recorded, so it will be uploaded to our website at the end of it, alongside the report, which will be going live at the end of this session. So that's the end of the housekeeping. We've got 45 minutes today, so let's move straight on into the purpose of the session. So we want to share with you the findings and the recommendations that we've got from our research report that we're launching today, which many of our members across the country have helped to shape. We want to discuss what's coming up next in regards to this report and some of the insights that we have for devolution. It's with your support that we aim to take these recommendations to support our advocacy, to get the powers and support and the financing that you need to deliver your net zero ambitions locally. So why have we conducted this study? Well, we're in a really important moment in time. The government wants to move quickly. The government wants to make a difference to people's lives, but they're still dealing with some of the broken systems and the legacy of public services which need reform and a fragmented ecosystem to deliver net zero. Local government is going to have some big challenges coming over the horizon, whether it be the 1.5 million house building target, planning reform or energy decarbonisation. The work that needs to happen to address climate change runs through local authorities. So in this new period, this new parliament, this new government, we need to be on the front foot in making the case for the powers and the finances to help us deliver for our communities. And it's really important for local authorities, given that they have influence and using their convening power to influence around 82 percent of emissions. So we are should be the delivery partner of choice um, and this research is about how we can accelerate that delivery. So we undertook this research and we aligned it to the priorities that the government has set out and also the legislative timetable and the bills that are going to come through parliament so that there is a clear map and a clear pathway to the recommendations that we put together. So what's been happening so far. Well, some of our previous work that we put on the screen around our work in powers in place, which was that handbook of local authority powers, coming together to look at what powers you currently have and some of the overarching framework discussions. And also we've done last year our Mission Zero Coalition UK 100 partnership. We looked at taking the heat out some of that local climate action pledge for our candidates. And also we had a series of asks in the election that we put to all of the major political parties. So as I said, the government wants to move quickly and we've already seen some impressive steps uh, as articulated on the slide. But ambition alone won't just force delivery through, it's going to have to look at a reset and a co-design of those powers, which is why what the, what the report is absolutely grounded in. So we'd like to take the next few minutes to discuss the research, who we engaged with, and some of the recommendations that are coming from it. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Phil and Tanisha, who are going to walk you through the research. Hi, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking everybody who engaged with us in the different phases of the research. This would not have been possible without your insights and support. 
Um, so through the different phases, which included workshops, one-to-one -one interviews with councils and a survey, uh, we managed to engage with 51 councils and that represent like 29% of UK's population. We've covered different regions, urban and rural councils, different tiers of government and different political parties, as you can see here. Uh, moving on, we asked all of the councils what they thought were the biggest barriers for local net zero delivery. And as we saw in powers in place, it came back to funding and resources and the inability to apply for competitive bids. Lack of a statutory duty was next. Uh, that led to net zero being deprioritized. Planning and regulatory barriers and challenges in effectively engaging with communities or some of the others. We then went on to understand what changes would help overcome some of these uh, barriers from the lens of actual impact. And as you'll see in this slide and the next, we've sort of split our recommendations into two groups, which is solve and scale. Solve refer to the quick wins and the small changes that can help accelerate delivery. And scale are some of the longer term interventions that we need to work towards, which also includes the need for financial resources where required, which could be government led or private financing. Coming to the recommendation specifically around energy. Uh, so starting with energy, we've got these are the top four recommendations that came out, which were from more than 70% of the survey responses. It started with the NPPF and the fact that it needs to be compatible with the Climate Change Act, which means net zero needs to be front and center of any plan that is made. Unfortunately, it's not in the current NPPF consultation, which is currently out. If you haven't seen it or not responded to it, please do so. If you have any feedback for us that we could include in our response, just send it our way and we'll put it in ours as well. The next up is energy planning and LEAPs. So local area energy plans are the data-driven, evidence-based approach to defining which are the most suitable decarbonization pathways. And analysis has shown that LEAPs could reduce costs by over two thirds and with almost doubling bill savings compared with the one size fits all approach national plans have. Unfortunately, they're not sort of the recommended thing or there's not a framework at present, which is what we're asking for. And this will also become important with bottom-up regional plans that are being developed through the RESPs. Then up is renewables. And in order to achieve net zero by 2050, all planning barriers and budget constraints need to be removed to support local delivery. Community energy is another thing that can play a major role, but that needs long-term strategic plans and funding and investment. Our energy toolkit, if you've seen it and attended the webinar last week, has links on how to get started with community energy. So if you want to take a look at that, please go ahead and do so. And lastly, on energy, we have the grid, which was highlighted by almost everyone we spoke to. And according to the electric electricity system operator, the electricity demand is likely to increase by 64% by 2035. And the wait time to connect to the grid in some places is more than a decade. So our key ask for from the government is to sort of create a plan uh, which should be de developed in collaboration with local authorities, but also GB Energy, the Clean Energy Mission, and communities, and create that plan for the grid expansion. Moving to housing, we can start with some of the quick wins, which are the zero carbon building standards, which was set by a lot of the members that we spoke to. Many members expressed their frustration with trying to go beyond the national standards just because the national standards at present don't do the job. There's an ambitious house building target of 1.5 million homes, but without there being national standards of making them net zero, uh, money will have to be spent to make them livable now and to be retrofitted, retrofitted later. The next one is, again, prioritizing Climate Change Act in the in planning policy. And coming back to that, that's, that's super critical to do right now. Uh, coming to retrofit, which was, again, a major challenge that was highlighted by most of the members. And estimates suggest that by 2050, we would need 29 million homes to be retrofitted. The current system is unfortunately broken short term 
with short-term competitive funding costs that do not allow for strategic planning and long-term strategies or building the sector which is necessary. So we feel the social housing needs to become that catalyst for transforming and scaling the entire retrofit sector. And the report goes into some depths on why this is critical and how it would be done. And then lastly, is something that stitches all of this together and is interlinked to everything, which is the skills necessary to deliver on all of these goals. Unfortunately, short-term funding gives no sig signals to industry for the future demand that's possible. And the construction industry and the retrofit industry, as well as the supply chain, need to be geared up to deliver on the scale that's needed. So these were some of the key recommendations in energy and housing, and the report goes into some depth in all of this. But I'm going to now hand over to Phil to take us through the overarching recommendations. Thanks very much, Tanisha. Um, I'm, as well as looking at energy and housing, we had some overarching recommendations from all of our members. And I think working in local government, talking to local government during the course of the research, we're really conscious of the financial position uh, of local authorities. So it won't come as a big surprise that one of the big conclusions was around funding and ensuring that those short-term pots, that uncertainty around how those pots are allocated and the opportunity cost of bidding for those pots is resolved by the new government. Without that certainty, not only can local authorities really struggle to do the long-term planning that they need to deliver on net zero, but they also can't work with private finance and unlock that crowding in finance to allow them to deliver. So we're asking for funding to be deployed in a way that acts as a catalyst to grow the sectors and that helps that private finance uh, invested. Talking to businesses, either through local authorities or through some of our national relationships, it's really clear that all of the sectors that are needed to deliver net zero at a local level, whether that's construction or energy, need the clarity and certainty uh, and scale that the government needs to provide in terms of their frameworks. We've also been exploring with our members a need to sort of fix the machinery of government and talk about a cross-departmental net zero delivery authority, which would coordinate and be that crucial glue between local and national government and ensure that all of those barriers and frustrations can be worked through in terms of the, the funding and policy and strategic delivery and really unlock those ambitious local councils that want to deliver. We know from talking to local authorities as well that there are a lot of competing priorities. I think there are over a thousand different uh, statutory duties that local government have. And um, when people are deciding where to deploy resources, where to uh, allocate their time, those can become competing priorities within local authorities. So 75% of our survey respondents said that they would like a statutory duty to ensure that climate action is not deprioritized in those discussions. But they were also extremely clear in both the survey and in their conversations with us that any duty of that nature needs to come with the necessary uh, funding and resources. Finally, I think it's come uh, across very strongly from talking to our members, but also reflecting on the wider debate around things like planning reform, that we need a really long lasting commitment to community engagement. We can't have funding pots and policies that arrive into local government without the opportunity to build the consensus and co-production that it enables better delivery. So it's not just about solutions and policies and money, it's about achieving those right outcomes and the just transition that so many of our members and UK100 wants to see. So ensuring that engagement is embedded in all of these policies is absolutely vital. We are continuing our work on local climate engagement. It was a project that was started last year with Involve and other partners. And uh, very shortly, we'll be publishing a new toolkit on how to embed uh, strong engagement principles in not just the strategic development of climate action plans, but also moving into delivery uh, and making sure that the right foundations are in place. <laughs>